Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Uh, yes, yeah. right. Okay, so everybody. I did, yeah. So, uh, yeah, I was. Uh, I was going to uh, recap this little anecdote. The, uh, the, uh, Frank uh, Dellard got his PhD from Carnegie Mellon in 2001, and I was invited to be his external examiner. And it's a very memorable occasion because, well, he did a wonderful job, and then we had a party, I think. Uh, was it Chuck Thorpe's house? Or? It was at my house. Oh, no, it was at your house. That's right. I was talking to a bunch of people. And the next morning, I woke up, and I was supposed to give a talk at CMU, and the whole day was scrambled up because it was 9-11, 2001. So it was a, a very memorable date for a lot of us. Um, but Frank's thesis was on, uh, on how to do structure for motion when the correspondences are very uncertain, and therefore they require Monte Carlo techniques to establish the association. And uh, he's been doing a lot of work with Monte Carlo since then, both in robotics, uh, which is sometimes called simultaneous localization and mapping, um, and structure for motion and other applications. And this is, uh, today he's going to give us a research talk on some of his more recent research, and then tomorrow at the University of Washington he's giving a more fundamental tutorial on this topic. All right, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we got to keep break for another week. There was no planes, uh, you know. Um, all right. Um, so the talk is a sample of Monte Carlo methods in robotics and vision, which is a pun in itself. But, um, so, so there's a lot of this work is, is done with Sarkar uh, Balch, who is my colleague. Um, he leads the bio tracking project uh, with me at Georgia Tech, and then uh, graduate students Sia Khan, Michael Case, uh, Rafael Zbornski is in fact a very smart undergrad. Uh, and there's a couple of other students um, whose work I might touch upon. Uh, so this is really an overview talk, and I'm not going to go into extremely deep technical detail on any of the topics. Um, so, but you can always ask me questions, and I'll try to uh, uh, go deeper at that time. Oh, uh, I never finished the outline of this talk, so this only contains the first part, which is overview of the uh, CPL and Borg labs at Georgia Tech. So I'm part of two labs at Georgia Tech. One is a computational perception lab. Um, and you might or might not know that, but at uh, Georgia Tech, we have a very strong vision pr presence. So in the College of Computing alone, we have uh, Aaron Bobbick, uh, myself, Irfan Issa, Jim Ray, and Ted Starn are all doing vision work. Um, and in the ECE department, electrical engineering, we, still, we have uh, Ramesh Chain, who is also actually cross appointed with, uh, with the College of Computing. Uh, Alan Tannenbaum, very well known in medical imaging and, and media access and, and, and things like that. And Tony Yezzi, uh, who probably came through here as well, I guess. No? Um, so Tony Yezzi does a lot of cool um, structure for motion work with uh, you know, Stefano Sovato. And so. Um, these bugs? Um, no, that's a that's a, a, a piece of the uh, cigarette video by Irfan Issa and uh, Arno Schödel. This is his video textures, where they um, they run this. They can have these bugs go informations by by uh, by some constrained motion and stuff. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, they actually also have two gerbils or so going. You know, you might have seen this video when. So the cigarette proceedings fall and the gerbils just get out of the way right in time before they are crushed. Um, so cool, cool little videos. That's Ted Starner. It's his, his stock photo with his, uh, you know, cyborg. Um. Seems to be this obsession with insects at Georgia Tech. Um, it's a south. There's a lot. You know, it's very hot in the summer and lots of insects. Um, uh, so, so it might, yeah. So the computer vision work that uh, Rick Zelisky, uh alluded to was um, I, I did for my thesis. I, I, I worked on structure from motion. So if you have 11 images like that, you could track these uh, features and then do a 3D reconstruction. 
but if you if you don't actually have a sequence that is so nice and smooth, you could wonder how to do this um, correspondence of features between the images. And so I'm not going to get, get into that, but um, I formulated the whole thing in uh, an EM framework, where EM was a hidden the correspondence was a hidden variable, and the structure was the uh, uh, parameters to be optimized for. And so when you run EM, kind of the structure pops out while the correspondence is being resolved. And, and in the, the ESAP was completely implemented using Markov chain Monte Carlo. Um, so that's, that's, that's my PhD work, and uh, I won't go into detail here. Um, my current main vision uh, pet project is, is a 4D Atlanta. And uh, so this is an image from so somewhere in the 1930s, I guess, or maybe actually probably 50s uh, from Atlanta. Coca-Cola commercial that has been there for a long time. Um, and so suppose if you had uh, thousands of such images over the past 150 years of Atlanta, or in fact any other city, maybe more interesting cities like Atlanta or Brussels, uh, where I'm from, um, could, you, could you feed this to a computer and then uh, automatically have it churn for a while and automatically build a 3D model? <clears throat> with a little time slider, okay, so that it completely does all the uh, correspondence between these thousands of images across time and space, and does a 3D a structure recovery, and then figures out what the temporal uh, relations is between all these images. So you can actually build a time-varying model of a city. Um, I think this is a very cool project. I pitched it to NSF a couple of times, and they can get through to them. <laughs> but um, yeah, if you think this is cool and you have money, please give it to me. Um, yeah, so this is basically the idea. And um, what the, uh, the, the, the strategy that we employ is, is, is uh, using knowledge. And um, so, so knowledge might be a, a dirty word from the 70s. Um, and now everything is hot, that, hot, that is hot involves probability. But I think. You get cool things if you take knowledge and, uh, and, and try to build probability distributions over knowledge. And so in particular, we are looking at grammar-based uh, inference where we, uh, we use stochastic grammars to, to try and parse these buildings and then do the uh, correspondence between images on a semantic level rather than simply on the geometric level. Um, <coughs> we, we use assumptions about the scenes like um, orthogonality and um, I'll, I'll show a little bit about the work that we're doing there uh, later. When you say that you really mean a gridded uh, street layout, or you just mean presence of orthogonality? No, I mean I, I mean a gridded street layout. But but uh, one of the things that, in fact, it will be a poster at CVPR is there was a beautiful paper called Manhattan World um, by Kaplan and Yuli, who assumed that the world was basically Manhattan, so three. Uh, mutual or orthogonal vanishing points. <coughs> and so we have a paper um, which is um, tongue in cheek called Atlanta World, where we relax that assumption so that we have multiple uh, orthogonal grids, or in fact, any constraint that you want to put on, um, on vanishing points, but, but put a, a more sophisticated computational architecture behind it so that you can do more challenging things than simply three uh, orthogonal viewpoints. Are using maps? We're not using maps, no, no. Although, um, so when we say uh, assumptions about urban scenes, we have been looking at at, um, at the data. So there is some data. In fact, strangely enough, fire insurance, uh, they have lots of maps of uh, structures over time. Um, you know, they're just little blocks um, and on street maps, but they have a large database of such maps. And so you could actually use that to do a, a, a 3D model of Atlanta where you have 2D space and 1D uh, time and you kind of see the blocks evolve over time. So yes, that, w that would be one source of information that would be very interesting to look at. I know um, one of uh, Roberto Cipolla's students actually looked at using maps. Um, in a way, it's simply a constraint from an orthogonal viewpoint. So you could take it into the multi-view geometry uh, framework like that. Okay, so the Manhattan world, in fact, I, so we have Atlanta world. 
So we have, we have things like that <coughs> where the, uh, instead of three mutual orthogonal uh, vanishing points, we now have five because we have buildings that are, we have two different grids there and one vertical. And so we can group the edges <coughs> according to which vanishing point they belong to. Um, in the tutorial tomorrow, I'll talk a little bit about uh, getting rid of some of the junk on this building. Um, using Markov random fields. So I'm, I'm also part of, um, when I came to tech, I, I actually came with Tucker Balch uh, from Carnegie Mellon, and we started up a, um, a robotics lab, uh, which is called the Borg Lab. <coughs> and so, so this is one of our robots, uh, and, and things that I did is build these, um, or I have them built, uh, these multi-camera rigs and then the idea there is to uh, to drive these robots. So each of these little blocks is a firewire camera, and they're on two firewire buses connected to a laptop. And so the idea would be, well, can you drive them into an environment and do real-time urban mapping um, with multiple of these? And then you'll do the data solution between different robots. And I know a lot of that kind of work is going on here as well with the ladybug. Um, <coughs> so. so uh, it's, it's a big interest of mine. Oh, and we use this robot in a competition to do robot rescue. So, in fact, these are little Sony eyeballs sitting on the back. Uh, this was really a big undergrad project to send this robot into a, uh, a collapsed structure or something, and the robot would map out, and then the little dogs would go search for victims. It's kind of very motivating for undergrads to, uh, to work on this. So. Oh, so this is a close-up of these uh, of these uh, cameras. Um, they're not as good as the ladybug cameras, which is causing a little bit of a headache. But, uh, I didn't have the 20k to spend. To, uh, <laughs> the ladybug, the quality video is not good either compared to the digital still cameras. Hmm. But uh, do they have overlapping fields too? Slight. So we, we can close the whole loop and we can build the panoramas, but. Um, um, no, no, no st yeah, basically stereo is useless on this. No, we, get, we get stereo when we just move the rig. Right. Um, <clears throat> and something I won't talk about, but I'm very interested in talking to you about more, is this closing the loop idea of uh, going around in very large environments and doing 3D structure for motion. Um, uh, but a problem they have is if when they go around in a large loop, a lot of structure for motion work has trouble connecting back up. Okay, and this gets worse if you go in complicated loops in the environment. So I have a student working on that. And then finally, the uh, one of the biggest and well, most uh, best funded projects in, in the Borg Lab is the biotracking project, um, which is an NSF funded um, where we track social insects. So we actually have live ants and bees in the lab, and when you visit uh, Georgia Tech, you'll get a little jar of honey from our own bees, and depending on the season, because honey tastes differently, depending on what, what flowers are in bloom, you get pretty good honey. Um, so that's kind of an overview of the lab, so. The, yeah, and, and in fact, when we started this project up, we were in a secure building because they did some classified radar work on the fifth floor or something. So nobody could get in and out without being checked, but we drilled a little hole in the in a window pane and so to, for bees to uh, go out and collect uh, pollen and all that. And um, so they were the only organisms that could get in and out of this building without proper idea. So, um, so the talk that... The, the rest of the talk is, is technical and is an overview of some of the uh, work that we do, and specifically about how we use IDs from statistics, and, and, and very specifically Monte Carlo approximations in a variety, variety of domains in computer vision and robotics. Um, and so statistics has, has um, a probability, you know, statistics departments, all these techniques that have been developed in statistics departments are now uh, heavily flowing in all computer science fields, um, 
most notably in computer vision and robotics because that's where they're very useful. But machine learning, of course, is a large community where, where a lot of this is happening. But in fact, also systems. Now, now a lot of systems people are discovering that you can tune um, routers and all that stuff using by learning a little bit about about traffic, etc. Um, so there is this large uh, volume of knowledge that's being transferred to computer science. So I'll be talking about my favorite fields. Um, I'll talk a little bit about a variety of techniques, all Monte Carlo uh, estimation techniques, particle filtering, um, Markov chain Monte Carlo. Uh, Rao blackwellization is a technique to speed up MCMC. Um, and, um, and then there is a bunch of it's very useful if you do have to do model selection. This will become clearer as I tell. So when I was at Carnegie Mellon still, um, I did something which was not my thesis, but I kind of did on the side. And I think I'm more well known for that thing I did on the side than I <laughs> am for my thesis, which is um, um, when you have robot localization, and this will motivate M M Monte Carlo uh, estimates in general. Uh, suppose you have a little robot in a, in a small 1D environment. This is kind of a straw man application. And there is two doors. Well, if you would do Bayesian inference about the location of the robot, you might have a prior density as to where the robot is. I discretize it here, so it's a prior. Um, if, if the robot sees a red door at this very moment, it induces a likelihood function. It says I'm either here or here because I know where the doors are. Okay. And the posterior probability distribution as to where the robot is, is takes the prior and the likelihood and multiplies those, and you get a posterior probability distribution as to where the robot is. Okay, and the posterior somehow um, captures everything you can, everything you know about the, the location of this robot, right? Given uh, your prior knowledge and your measurements, and this captures everything, and so you can compute estimates from this as to, say, the mean position of the robot, which might be somewhere here, might be a bad point estimate, or the maximum a posterior estimate, which would be here. OK. Uh, so this is just Bayesian inference. <coughs> now, in real robot uh, scenarios, um, densities, measurement densities are non-Gaussian and, and, and complicated. and um, and so analytic solutions are, are re rarely available. Um, so, so instead, what you could do is, uh, I'm, I'm not going to go through a text, but you could, what you could do is say, if this is your prior, you could sample from this prior and weight it by the likelihood function. And so I've, did, I've done this here five times. And you get a, an approximation as to what the posterior is. If you do this many times, OK, say 100 times, you get a better approximation as to what the, the posterior is. So this is important sampling. OK, so this is one very well-known Monte Carlo method of estimating this posterior, which is not easy to do analytically. Um, and sampling like this gives you a lot of um, advantages. There are some disadvantages as well, as people liking variational methods will will tell you, but you can represent arbitrary densities. The memory that you use is only proportional in the number of samples that you choose to, to use. Um, if you sample correctly from the true posterior probability distribution, you will only spend computation where the posterior has a high value, because that's the definition of sampling. You will sample where there is a high probability that you have uh, uh, Probability. <laughs> so, um, and it's a great visualization tool. Okay, Let's see if you, I'll, I'll show you a little um, animation in just a minute. Uh, the, the downside of it is that it's approximate. Okay, and also that important sampling, which I just showed you on the previous slide, completely breaks down in high dimensions. Um, so if you do this recursively, you get a particle filter, which was um, discovered a while ago, but rediscovered in vision very notably by, by Michael Eisert and, uh, and Andrew Blake. Um, 
if you, if you write down recursively what the posterior is of a robot over time, you, you have a, a predictive density, which is derived from a motion model, uh, multiplied by a likelihood. And a Monte Carlo approximation would replace um, the, the posterior by a weighted sample set, which in effect is going to approximate this integral by a, a, a Monte Carlo estimate, which is a sum, a weighted sum. Okay. Um, and so you can sample from this approximate predictive density and weighted by the likelihood, and that is basically the particle filter. Um, so if you have a set of particles as to this is now a 2D example where the robot is at a certain moment, this might be your probability density approximation at time t minus 1. Each of these samples induces a motion. Okay, so the predictive density on this is actually a, um, a, a mixture model, all right? So the predictive density, even though in reality it's kind of a, um, suppose you had the true posterior right here, the true predictive distribution would be kind of a cloud here, right? Now you approximate this entire predictive density by a mixture model. And if you sample from this mixture model, meaning you sample an index and you sample from the motion model, you get a bunch of samples there, and then you upgrade them using a measurement model. Okay, so you sample from it, upgrade it by giving the weight equal to the measurement model. And the measurement model is typically derived from laser or sonar or vision. Okay, then, um, then you get the particle filter. So here is a little animation of how that works. Um, so, so this is actually the end of the animation. But, uh, it will start over, and so in the beginning, particles are spread all over the place because you don't know where the robot is, and then these blue sonar measurements come in and, and constrain more and more where the position of the robot is. Uh, part samples are very good at dealing with multiple hypotheses. There is four now, and then at the end, only two will remain, and when the robot goes into a room which looks different from this room, so it actually sees... Um, Furniture that is not present in this room, this cloud disappears and is gone. Okay, so so it's great to visualize what is going on, right? And the more samples you throw at it, the better the visualization is. It's great in 2D. It's great in 2D. Well, in fact, the, the beauty of uh, of samples is if you, even if you have a 1,000 dimensional uh, density that is represented as samples, to project it in any of the two, to, to do any projection in 2D, you just choose the two dimensions that you're interested in and you automatically have a marginalization, right? So it's, it's quite easy also to do a marginalization to any 2D slice that you want. So this was at ICRA 99, uh, and, and now it's, it's, it's very popular for robot localization, and so we called it Monte Carlo localization. But really what it was is taking Iser's idea of the particle filter and applying it to robot localization, realizing that you could globally localize the robot with that as well, um, but it has become very popular in robotics. Now, that's great, and so if you're funded by NSF to track insects, um, you might think, well, okay, how can we apply this to tracking bugs, right, instead of robots? Now we want bugs, but... Um, but bugs, there are many of them. Um, so, so we had a, a paper at ECCV, which we just um, presented there. Um, it was a poster. Um, and the idea is the following. So how can we, I don't know what the, the computer is going to do right now. OK, yes, that's what it's going to do. Um, so, so this is 20 ants uh, um, in Tucker's kitchen um, in a little dish. Um, and uh, how, how do we track all of them at the same time? Okay, that's, that's, the, um, that's the problem. Now, multi-target tracking is not a new field, okay? Um, a lot of air traffic control uh, systems have complex, sophisticated multi-target tracking machinery in there. But all the previous literature on multi-target tracking, uh, in essence, can be viewed as um, curve fitting. Okay, so here's two tracks of, of uh, in an air traffic control situation where two planes 
the radar blips overlap, and so you don't know which one uh, this plane, you know, this dot does it belong to this plane or that plane. So a lot of that is really curve fitting using motion models. And using the curve fitting, you can actually put a probability distribution on which plane this dot came from and do the data association in that way. Right. So, so there is a huge literature there, but um, as the following video will show, ants are not airplanes. And so they, they interact, they stop, they sniffle, and they go off in different directions. So there is no, um, um, you can try to do curve fitting, but it's, it's not very, uh, it's not going to be very effective. Okay. Um, and so, well, one thing you could try to do is just to put a particle filter on each end and, and just ignore the problem of them interacting. Okay, and this is the, the, the result of, of doing that. So each of these green boxes is one particle filter. Um, now, the, the way we present these results are is the video will stop for one second when the tracker loses track, and you have to, the game is to find the ant that was, uh, that was dropped by one of the particle filters. And so that was, uh, so right over there. This one lost its tracker now. Okay, over there. And these ones, and so the typical failure mode, if you look at this for a little while, is that you have um, uh, you have these particle filters, and an ant, another ant is nearby that looks like it's a cooler ant, a better looking ant. At ECCV, I, I said something to the effect that it's like the French, they they see a better looking <laughs> woman, they abandon their wife, and so. It's like a particle filter does the same thing. There is a cooler end there, and boom, you know, no loyalty whatsoever. If there's any French people in the audience, I apologize, but since I'm Belgium, um, I'm allowed. <laughs> so, so this typical failure mode, how could we deal with that? Well, one way to deal with it is um, to put a Markov random field on top of this, and a Markov random field is um, you introduce um, edges between the uh, between ends where edges indicate some interaction that you're going to model, but even more importantly, the absence of edges between ends um, says that they, they, they will not interact. So whenever you have two disconnected components, you'll treat them separately, but when they come nearby, you'll have to treat their interaction. And using those edges, Markov random field theory gives you a very nice way of modeling any interaction you want on, on that um, that you can formulate in, in a Markov random field prior, basically. Um, so, so what we did is very general in that you can, you can put knowledge of biologists in this, uh, in this Markov random field, but we did something much, much simpler, which is uh, we're just going to say, well, ants typically don't crawl on top of each other, uh, so we'll We'll just make the marker and field prior um, punish the configuration if they overlap and, and not punish if they don't overlap. And our, in fact, our penalty function was blatantly uh, simple, which was just e to the minus pixels overlap with some parameter. Um, now, one of the cool things that you could do is actually learn these, these priors from real biological data, and that's what we're working on as well. Um, so what, what that will mean is we model this as a different motion model. So instead of simply having the motion model, so this is all 20 ants. This is the configuration of all 20 ants at the previous time step. Um, if you don't model any interaction, you can just model this as a, f a factored motion model. Each of the ants behaves independently, not knowing anything about anything else. Uh, but with the mark of random field prior, uh, th this is the only change that you do. So you have a pairwise interactions um, and a potential function that takes into account how close ants are. And if this has finite support, meaning outside a certain range, there is this function is zero, um, or not zero, the, the penalty is zero, so e to the minus penalty becomes one, then this has no influence whatsoever. Okay, so, um, so it automatically turns off edges, really. We don't have to turn them off explicitly. We just look at the distance between ants. Um, 
So that's great. In fact, Mark Ryan Fields modeled this really nicely. Uh, but there is one problem, okay, which is now instead of looking at 20 ants in, um, in isolation, you're looking all of a sudden at a configuration of 20 ants. Now, one ant is three dimensional, okay, x, y, and theta, uh, its orientation. 20 ants is six dimensional. Okay, so particle filters, be suspicious of any paper that you see um, that has a particle filter with more than five or six dimensions. Um, or look for this secret weapon in there, uh, because it, it is important sampling doesn't work in more than five dimensions, basically. Okay, um, so it's exactly the same. So we could do a particle filter. Um, here I, I, I sketched the situation with two ants. So this was our previous one ant thing, but now um, because I can't display six-dimensional distributions, I, I just coupled particles. So this. As saying this is one particle. Okay, so these are three samples of the joint posterior at time t minus one, right? And that induces a motion model, a predictive density, which is a mixture model. I just displayed the marginal now. You sample from it, but you sample joint particles, okay? And then you color them according to the um, uh, the likelihood, but now including the MRF term. Okay, so exactly the same story as before, but this will not work. And the reason is, it, it's 60 dimensions is too much. Okay, most of these particles up there will get a zero weight, and the one that happens to have the least zero weight wins out and takes all the probability mass. And that's that's the, the failure mode of important sampling. So, so this is what you do. Uh, this is what you get. So, um, it, it completely breaks down. Okay. So, so this is not supposed to be a good result. It's supposed to show that the particle filter has a that important sampling as an inference method. It just fails miserably in high dimensions. All right. Any questions here? So the solution that we, we came up with was instead, if important sampling breaks down, well then use a smarter inference methods in the in the particle filter, which is Mark of Chain Monte Carlo, right? I was expecting you to say that instead of the six dimensions, you'd only do three or nine dimensions at a time because you have small cliques, right? So you only have to sample from the clique of attracting ants. You could do that. Um, and in effect, this uh, Markov chain of Carlo is going to do exactly the same. So if things if things are break up in cliques, uh, in fact, if all 20 ants are far away from each other, MCMC is going to do more or less exactly the same as what a particle filter does. Only it uses a rejection sampling scheme rather than importance sampling. But when they all bunch together, it will transition smoothly between between um, um, you know doing the cliques separately or treating all of them at once. And so there's no need to reason about the cliques even MCMC does it all for you. Uh, so I'm going to fly through MCMC because I, I, there is going to be a tutorial tomorrow at UW and, and I have really no time to get through all of it. But MCMC is kind of like, um, actually, because there's only two students here from UW anyway. I might be three then. Okay. <laughs> I might, um, how many are familiar with MCMC here? Okay, less than half of the audience. Okay, well, all right, so let me motivate it by something that I was going to talk about tomorrow, and I'll, I'll do, just do it twice, but um, the World Wide Web, okay, is a large market chain. You could look at it as a large market chain, right? In fact, you go to any web page and you click randomly on a link. Right. Then my question to you is, if you do this a thousand times, where will you end up? Can you can you give any guess, or is this completely useless to even try and guess at that? So just say, follow a thousand random links. So just pick uniformly from any link on a page and just go. Well, 
if, if I hold a gun to your head, what would you say would be the website you would be after a thousand clicks? eBay. Google? Yeah, I'd say eBay. eBay? Yeah, any more? Windows <laughs> Update. Maybe. Uh, Yahoo would be a good one. MSN also. Yeah. So, yes, that's right. There is a couple of sites that can attract stuff. But they have a lot of incoming links. Okay. Um, you can formalize this as, if you look at the web as a Markov chain, right, the stationary distribution of this Markov chain is the probability that you'll end up at a certain place. So if you do a thousand links, the stationary distribution of that Markov chain is exactly um, the probability of ending up at a certain site. Uh, or after an infinite amount of clicks, in fact. Uh, after a while, it converges, and the probability distribution is always the same. You can start wherever you want, after a thousand clicks, you'll have the same probability distribution on all these sides. Um, but that doesn't mean you'll be at the same place. It won't be. No, no. It, it will be that if, if, if um, there's a probability distribution yeah. there, you won't be at the same place. But if, if, if the, the probability distribution is very peaked, with high likelihood you'll be at the same place. With high likelihood you'll be at the other right. um, By the way, that probability distribution, is called page rank, and it's why Google is making millions of dollars. All right. So think about it. You all know what Markov chain Monte Carlo is, in fact, because it's a method to go to high probability areas by following small steps in a Markov chain. And if your Markov chain has exactly the probability, the station and distribution that you're interested in, is this the, uh, the target distribution that you're interested in is the stationary distribution of the chain, then you'll sample from that stationary distribution after doing a couple of random steps. So in fact, you start at a random state, and you walk into space, um, and, and this has the effect of running up. It's like stochastic gradient descent almost. It runs up uh, gradients and then samples out high probability areas. And uh, there is a very simple algorithm to, to make this happen. I'm sorry, this is P of X prime here. Yeah. So, so you, you start at a random state, you propose a move, but that move might not be the right one for your particular target density. So you calculate a, a correction on it, which is the acceptance ratio. Uh, this should be the, the target density of the uh, of the uh, proposed state, so x prime, and then you accept that move with a certain probability. And, and doing this acceptance ratio business has the effect of making your chain have exactly the correct stationary distribution. So it, it's like modifying the web to have the distribution you want. Um, for example, you could do this by introducing a little virus in every computer that favors links to your home page. Now you have modified the web to have a stationary distribution which is concentrated on your home page. And it only has to have a slight bias towards it and everything will go to your home page. And that's the principle behind Markov Chain Monte Carlo. I, I know I'm not doing it justice here and in the five minutes I have, I can't. Uh, but at least the UW students will know of that tomorrow in, in much more detail. For the, for the AND business, it works as follows. You start with a sample at time t minus 1. Um, and you randomly pick a start sample. And then you perturb it randomly um, and accept or reject some, some of the perturbations. So, if you perturb one ant at a time, in fact, it leads to a very efficient chain. And so you kind of start walking um, in this new probability distribution, and you walk, and then you will sample out the probability distributions over the ants. So, um, and the result of that is, um, is quite nice. Uh, so it looks as if there is no failures, but in fact, in the beginning here, I think there is a switch failure where the tracker actually turns around. Um, but it works magnificently better than 
important sound. Okay. Switch failure, do you mean switching the two trackers or uh, switching the two so or switching the orientation? It can still switch the two trackers, and there is no way we can actually deal with it at this moment. Because it ends oh, quite similar. Um, but, um, no, the switch, in fact, one of the, the failures here was, I think, that the tracker turned around on an end, meaning it was now, it thinks it's going backwards the whole time after that switch. Which our mo motion model is, is fine with, because... For application, is it important to maintain the identity of the ends, or is it just... Yes, it is important. It is. Yes, it is important. And in fact, we'll talk about a little bit about how we could do that. Um, anyway, so... Yeah, uh, can you say a little more about how you're using MDMC here? I didn't quite understand how to do it. Sure. So, okay, so... <clears throat> so this is a Monte Carlo estimate of the predictive density, these, these fuzzy blobs here, right? Uh, and picture this in 60 dimensions, right? So you, you have a, a blobby predictive density in 60 dimensions, or in, here in four dimensions. Um, or six, six, I think. It was two ends. Um, this is mod this predictive density is modified by a likelihood model, which is what the what the end looks like. So in fact, <clears throat> this is not really the posterior that we were sampling for, but you know, multiply this with a likelihood, and you get the posterior. Right. Um, so <clears throat> you start the two ends in a random configuration, sampled from from whatever. Um, and so, so this is your starting state, okay? And now, you propose to move this guy, you know, and A here, to that, to to that location. And then you evaluate this acceptance ratio. You say, was this a good move or a bad move? If it's a good move, I'll accept this move. If it's a bad move, I'll reject it. Okay, and and you keep doing this. You keep keep picking ants at random, and moving them, and then evaluating the acceptance ratio. Because you only move one ant at random, um, the acceptance ratio will actually only contain turns for that one ant. So you only have to evaluate the likelihood, the image model at these two locations, the old location and the new location, and then look at its interaction with its immediate neighbors, and you get an acceptance ratio. So for example, if the ant moves on top of somebody else, okay, then that acceptance ratio will be almost zero because that is heavily punished. If it moves away but still it has a good image model there, it might accept it. And so it's a very simple algorithm in universes. Propose to move, pick an ant at random, propose to move it, evaluate how good that, that new configuration is. If it wasn't good, you probably don't do it. By moving, do you mean actually taking a time forward, time step forward in time, or do you first predict everything, and this is just kind of refining the exterior, basically trying to? That's right. So, <clears throat> and I, I should be more conscious of that there is this is time, and there's only one time step involved, and then at time t you run a Markov chain, and it's all for time t, and but it. it so you do this maybe a thousand times, and you have a nice sample of the posterior at time t. You're running a Markov chain in different variants of this application. You also use some variation. Right? Object tracking, I could propose where I'm going to, and then I could use gradient descent to sort of lock it onto the target or something like that. Yes. Right? Yeah. This is here. You expect the thing to be fairly multimodal, so you think you need to do basically uh, stochastic search. Right? <coughs> Yeah, also, NCMC is a nice approximation method for complicated high dimensional densities, just like <coughs> variational approximations are. Um, so it's not clear that either variational or Monte Carlo estimates are better or worse. So it's just an alternative method. Right. But it depends if you, you know, if you really only have one local maximum. If the posterior isn't multimodal, then variation will probably more efficiently slide into the peak. Whereas if you have multiple, if it's multimodal, then variation will more explore the space well. Yeah. I could do better by updating some of the time, updating more than one hour at a time. That's 
also a problem with writing the Dalits. Right. Right. <clears throat> That's right. In fact, MCMC does have a problem with multimodality as well, in that it can be trapped in a single mode, and it can't get out until um, unless you have coordinated moves. Um, so that's a very good point. So I'm not I'm not sure whether in this case the application or the uh, the procedure is very multimodal. Um, I happen to like MC, uh, you know Monte Carlo approximations as a when when ants come together. That's the point. Because there are different descriptions. I'm not sure whether that induces multimodal per se, right? It, it induces something very global as a as an energy function, but that d doesn't necessarily imply multimodality. You think it does? That's my guess. Okay. Yeah. This this might be the same thing that Rick was asking. But so at time t, when you're making these random moves, are you are you moving? Uh, are you informed at all by the image? Do you try to move to like areas? No, we're not. You could. <coughs> so another way of saying MCMC, sorry, I'm like losing my voice. <coughs> Which really offended Sung Jun Zhu when I told him that. But <coughs> one way to look at MCMC is as a justification for any hack you can dream up. In a proposal density, you, stick, you, you use all your array of hacks and knowledge about computer vision that you can use. And do an informed guess as what the truth is and then you calculate the acceptance ratio and make it right again. And so smooth over all the hacks you have. And, and, and so whatever you can come up with to make this a better proposal, looking at the image model or using more sophisticated motion or whatever, is, is, um, is going to make this better. And indeed, coordinated moves is one way to, if you, if you, it's hard to, I think, to figure it out, but if you can propose, if you know magically how to propose coordinated moves, that will, in the case of that it's multimodal, um, will improve things. Right. Even in theory. <coughs> No, I if the density over the uh, over the motion model only, then you don't have. Oh no, no, I look at the observation. Um, look at the observation. No, I do look at the observation. Even even the future observation. <coughs> and the next time step. Oh, if you phrase it as where has N been yes. in the entire sequence, yes, but that becomes rather high dimensional. Uh, so we are not we are looking at the filtering distribution, which is time t given everything before that, not. You could do time t given everything. You could do time t given everything before that and the current situation. And the, and the future in the video that you're, yes, that's right. That's right. In your motion model, is it just that the end is likely to be exactly where it was in the previous frame, or is it more than that? No, it's, it's, a, it's a Gaussian which we actually learned from real data. Um, yeah, it's kind of like going to random now. No concept of velocity because they seem to not. No, no, there is. Um, no, we didn't. You're basically just specifying the current distribution. You have a set of particles and just kind of move them a little bit in a random direction. The motion model, yeah, yeah, yeah. In fact, if it's a Gaussian, you can just take your distribution and convolve it with that Gaussian and you get a predictive. Right. Yeah. But the motion model is then modified by this global MRF prior, which, which is a very nonlinear modification of that motion model. Or it's it's blurring it in a in a in a directed way. So if an ant is, is in a certain facing a certain direction, the, the Gaussian is biased towards that direction. So there is a substantial probability that it will move backwards as well. So if you're very highly maneuverable. And, and so one of the things that is in fact in the proposal of the NSF uh, proposal is if you can figure out what an ant is doing at a certain moment, is it is it foraging, is it defending the nest, is it, you know, you can actually condition the emotion modes on that. Very well. Functions are much more complicated than just. Uh, 
you, you were kind of giving an intuition that you're looking at whether they're close to it together, whether there's overlaps in pixel or blobs. And that's what the, the, what the phase, phase in the potential one is just the Gaussian that drops off quickly or exponentially drops off quickly. But you're saying now that it's more complex than that, the potential function. It, it is, a, sorry, if, if you don't look at the interaction, it's simply a Gaussian, and each ant is moved by a Gaussian. So you just, a generative model just draw from a Gaussian. If you take the observation into account, you would add this uh, pairwise MRF factor to the, uh, to that motion model. Let me move on, and now, uh, because uh, there is a couple other stuff that I wanted to convey. Anyway, this works really, really nice, okay? Okay. All right. Um, you, you can do, and, and this is a CPR talk, uh, so people at least like that. Honeybees are more challenging, and they, um, uh, so we, we used, uh, um, I guess, Microsoft Invention, which is probabilistic PCA uh, by Tipik and Bishop, um, to model the, uh, the appearance of honeybees. Um, and learned that model using EM, and then stick, stuck everything into a, a dynamic based network where location uh, is this Gaussian plus interaction term, but the appearance also has a temporal chain. Um, so, so it's, a, it's an eigenspace model where the eigenspace coefficients are correlated in time. And, this is a, and, and so we, we looked at a particle filter where this is sampled, but this is continuous and this part is done analytically. And so integrating out that second chain is an instance of rare blackbullization, meaning you treat parts. What you can treat analytically, you do treat analytically, and, and the result is that your particle filter is, is much better uh, than if you would sample both of those chains. Um, so uh, let me skip the math on that. Um, but, but here's, here's a honeybee application, okay, where um, the resolution is a bit crappy. But um, so, so here we have uh, a three-dimensional location tracker um, that also have this eigenspace model to model the appearance that is, can change dramatically uh, over a sequence because of specular reflections and, and deformations. Um, but we... So if you take an eigenspace model with five coefficients or ten coefficients, you could sample in the exact particle filter way those coefficients as well. And so do important sampling on both location and the eigens, uh, eigenspace representation. And that leads to many tracker failures because, again, you're going from three-dimensional to maybe a 13-dimensional space, three plus ten coefficients. And, and again, you have the problem of, of having a... Uh, a high dimensional space in which important sampling breaks down. Um, here is um, an image model that, um, where we analytically integrate out the appearance, but this is with only a mean image. So we don't actually use an eigenspace model, we only use the mean, like a mean B. Right? And we still have a lot of tracking failures. If you go to a model which takes 20 eigen coefficients, which are integrated out very efficiently. So instead of 23-dimensional sampling, we now do three-dimensional sampling and integrate out the common filter on the appearance coefficients. Um, we get quite nice tracking. So just in terms of visualization, every time you saw it, you lost the tracks. Yes. And then it's restarted manually by finding, putting the box down in the right place? Or what happens? How do you restart um, Yeah, yeah. So yeah, so yeah, just patches up the tracker at that moment. Okay. Search, you know, restart. No, no. Find people, find people. Um, well, by, by straight PPCA, so it is a generative model, which is a mean plus some eigen. No, it's not adaptive. So the only adaptation here is because of the common filter on the appearance coefficients. Well, we manually check, we manually get out. Oh, this is, yeah, so when we read your papers, we're like, we should be doing this EM thing over the entire video. But that's when I pose that to Zia, he's like, no, I'm not doing it. <laughs> so uh, here's two dancers. 
uh, with um, uh, 10 eigenspace coefficients and 500 particles per B uh, devoted. Um, so part, you know, one of our goals is to track the dancing bees in a, in a beehive uh, by which they communicate where the food is. And so it works quite nicely. Uh, this is not... So is this the, the quality of the bees that you can act? No, this is the MPEG compressed uh, presentation video. With little space to spare on the laptop. How big are the bees then, like pixel-wise? Um, it's probably, so it depends, so we, we normally do it on, on a reduced resolution, so this, this might be, um, the DV format is what, 525 on 720 or something? What, by 480? I thought it was something like five. But anyway, we, we downsampled that once to half, and, and that's the resolution we work on. And so, um, and so on the order of 20, 30 pixels in, the, in, in yeah. So, the, so the, the eigenspace model takes, uh, so if you have 50 by 70 pixel image in the full resolution image, it's a very high resolution image, but then the eigenspace res representation puts it back into a confined 20 dimensional or 10 dimensional space. How many samples are you using for the three XYZ parameters? 500. And actually, you use that for this one, which is what the traditional common filter would do. How quickly does it do that? Oh, oh, so, um, well, so we, we do do the particle filtering on on the B, right? So we, right. we don't we don't use comma filtering. So comma filtering would not only do one particle filter, but also expand the probability distribution yeah. of the gas. Yeah, that's right, right. So I'm just curious, have you compared this against the common filter, which is not a Monte Carlo? Uh, no, we haven't. We haven't be, because um, yeah. So Michael Eiser actually asked the same question, and um, so can't you do a image-based comma filter? It would be doing gradient descent on the images. Um, and I've, I've never been a proponent to try it, even, even though, I, I mean, I, I can do it um, because the bees and the ants just move very erratically. So I've never thought of the motion model as anything Gaussian, although I use it Gaussian. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So your particles are just samples? They're not samples plus plus covariance matrices? They're not Gaussians? Well, no, they're not Gaussians. They're simply... Oh. Yeah, yeah. Because so you could, you could do, you could, you know, propagate queries if it's twelve, and then it would be really like. Uh, yeah, that would be a solid gas filter. Right. Like, no, we're not doing that. You, you're right. I think. I guess that we should try that and show how common filters would break down because my intuition it would break down. Um, especially this thing can. I have other videos where bees are half overlapped and party filter goes nicely on and it's able to recover in a way that common filters in my experience will, will just completely yeah, go to hell um, all right so how much time do I have left minus five or something no, no we have room for an hour and a half so okay keep going. so Again, a piece of Microsoft-inspired <laughs> work here, um, which is uh, piecewise continuous curve fitting. It's kind of switching to a completely different um, domain. So, but um, um, this is um, suppose you have archaeological artifacts, okay, like uh, broken vases, etc. Uh, and you would r like to reconstruct those vases. So what we did is we, we took a vase and smashed it to pieces and then looked at uh, the shards coming from those vases and tried to fit them with, um, with curves. And so we know how to do um, 3D reconstruction from the texture on, on top of that, but that doesn't deal well with the, uh, the boundaries here that are arguably very important for reconstructing the vase, you know, making this puzzle thing. And, and reconstructing the vase back. And so people are working on Brown to give him a 3D model of a shard, putting back the vases. Uh, but, so we've concentrated on if you have multiple views of a shard, can we do a 3D reconstruction of the boundary of the shard? 
Um, and what we've used is subdivision curves as a representation of the 3D curve. And so um, subdivision curves, since I'm in Seattle, I shouldn't have to explain this at all. Um, but um, it starts from a uh, polygon mesh, um, which is then recursively subdivided an infinite amount of times uh, to yield a smooth curve at the end. Okay, And depending on the, uh, the averaging mask that you use, you can build all kinds of uh, uh, curve representations that you know, including B-splines and um, quadratic and cubic splines, and anything uh, that, you, uh, that you want. Um, so we, we really like that representation as a, as a representation of curves, because it's also, once you have the uh, polygon mesh, um, every point at a certain resolution, if you go to a certain resolution, maybe do this 10 times and then use the final mask, is a linear function of the original control points. So if you want to do this in a, uh, in a gradient descent setting, that's very nice because it's linear. Okay. Um, now, this, this doesn't fit. This is a subdivision curve fitting uh, the shard um, as nicely as possible, but it doesn't do justice to the shard because it doesn't have any corners. So there is this nice piece of work by um, um, use Happy here uh, at Microsoft Research, where in, two, in a 2D case, he tagged certain of the edges um, of subdivision uh, surfaces to induce creases and, not, and, and so piecewise continuous uh, surfaces. And so you can actually do the same with, with, a, uh, with a curve. It's, it's much easier, in fact, than with surfaces. You can just tag one of the control points, and then that will be a corner. In effect, locally changing your averaging mask so they will be interpolating at that point. Um, so here's a, a tagged control mesh. Um, and if you s infinitely subdivide, you get a piecewise continuous curve. OK? <clears throat> so um, let me just, um, all right, let's see. So let's go back one. OK, how, how do I explain it? Well, since once you have the tag configuration, everything is linear, modulo, because if we have multiple views of one shard, there is a nonlinear projection in there. But it's relatively mild, and we know how to deal with it. Um, once I give you the tag configuration, it's relatively easy to, to quickly fit a, uh, a subdivision curve to all of the images. It's only linear in the sense the snakes are linear. I mean, you're, you're trying to find a good edge, so you may search a while and so snap onto the edge, right? You're close to the edge. True. True. But, but um, the way we do it, uh, because we have known backgrounds here, okay, and, um, and we have this nice calibration grid, we simply segment the whole thing, make a camper image out of it, and then this, this is pulled to uh, the vision there is not very, very hard, right? Um, the reason why we did this is, in fact, because the Japanese wanted us to do this. Um, they they didn't ever, never ever give us money for it, but so we never even gave them the technology. Um, but they wanted to have um, little field stations all over Japan where they take uh, a bunch of camera images from archaeological artifacts and quickly scan them in the 3D. And so this would be cheaper with a video camera than with a, uh, a laser scanner, I'd say. I see in the bush nothing, so maybe he got the money, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, so once we, so we can easily fit. You're going to show us the assembled maze at the end. The sample. The assembled maze. No, I'm sorry. Uh, that's, that's, I, I would give these things to Brown. That's maybe. why I didn't get the money. <laughs> <laughs> you're right. You're probably right. Uh, so this is the optimization problem of the, uh, once I give you the tag configuration, I can find the parameters of this curve pretty easily given the measurements. Okay, um, and but it induces a probability distribution on the control points. Now, so if I integrate out the control points, I have the probability of a certain tag configuration, the margin probability. Um, now, if you have a, a curve with ten um, 
control points to its two to the 10th uh, possible configurations in a large space where again MCMC trusts itself to the foreground as an approximate inference method. And it's even cooler because um, the ECCG paper, so we had a workshop at ICCV which had say 10 control points, the number of control points is fixed, but if you don't know how many control points there are, you can set up a reversible jump MCMC chain to, to jump between these spaces of different dimensions. And so um, TED can be either 10 dimensional or 12 dimensional or 15 dimensional, and when you integrate it out, it's, it's, it's that difference in dimensionality is gone. And so. Are you going to teach us tomorrow about reversible jump? Um, I'll, I'll, I'll show Steve the <laughs> presentation, see if it is appropriate uh, level. It's not in there, but if there is a lot of um, interest in it. I just hear about it, so I'd like to learn more. It is. Yeah. I could, I, could, I could put it in there, or I had like an extra credit session at the end there. So here's, here's an example of, of typical results. Uh, we initialized a curve on a circle somewhere close to the shard, which is easy to do. Uh, these are three of the different views. We actually use probably six, but this is actually a control view. So it's not used in the fitting whatsoever. So we sample a couple of times, and I think this is maybe after 16 or 12 samples only. So this is after two, where we introduced maybe a couple of, maybe not, I don't know where the corners are, let's see. Uh, uh, no corners here because a corner is indicated by a, a, a time sign and a plus is a, a normal control point. And so after a couple of samples, we already have a nice fitting of the curve. This is a control view, so it's, this view is not used in the optimization, so this is a pretty good result. Okay. But since we're sampling over tags, configuration. We're not actually finding the best one. Okay, We're not doing like a branch and bound search. We're sampling. Um, here's another result of a different chart. Um, since we're sampling, we can do things like, well, how many tag control points are there? How many corners are, does this chart have? And what we get as an answer is not five, but a histogram over, you know, this was with the fixed number of points. From 0 to 10, well, chart 2 has approximately four or five corners, but it could actually be two as well with this probability. So we get much more knowledge than simply optimizing for one, um, one nice tag configuration. So is there much, I mean, is there really a joint, do you need to model the joint distribution between tag points? I mean, you could just sort of decide for every control point independently. Should I turn this into a tag point or not? And you wouldn't have to do this fancy sampling speaking. But it's not fancy. <laughs> it's easy to do. So, um, and plus, yes, it's um, the, 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 the location and the, the nature of a control point that one influences the entire curve up to the next control point. So they are coupled at least locally between control points. Um, yeah. So it's again the same answer as with the, the ants. Okay. So we, yes, we could do something which takes advantage of some some knowledge of the domain, or trying to do it easier. Or, but MCMC really will kind of do it for you and reason about it for you. If it's independent, it will not spend more computation because it's MCMC. You buy that. Yeah, I guess I thought I was talking about that there is a coupling between control points, so it makes sense to consider them together. Right. But the part I was smiling about is, and I don't work in this area, but I get the impression that if you're going to use a particle filter for something that is well modeled by gas, it, it takes a lot more computational effort. Right? So it's, it's useful when you need to maintain multiple hypotheses. But but I guess in this case it's a discrete thing anyway, so it's not even meaningful. But you're 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 talking about the ants models as yeah. well and then the bees and well it's debatable. Uh, if you do have to do gradient descent on something that is fifty by seventy pixels, you're gonna have to look at fifty times seventy pixels and do a couple of iterations on extended common filter. How much computation are you spending? Um, 
they're probably, yeah, less than a part of the I, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. Um, but you then don't get the robustness of the problem, of the part of the problem. Uh, the final, final uh, application of MCMC, which is a robotics application, <clears throat> and will be a little preview of what our closing the loop will be. We haven't gotten a publication on that, but um, <clears throat> um, oh, so, <clears throat> so let me just quickly motivate it. If, in robotics, <clears throat> there is a lot of map about, uh, work about mapping space. You have a little robot that runs around, has a laser rangefinder, <clears throat> and you do something to build a nice, crisp map about. I think there are some people at the University of Washington that are good at this. Uh, <laughs> of, of the environment. Um, <clears throat> and, um, but it's debatable whether you need a metric map of your environment, whether you need to know exactly where each piece of wall is to be able to navigate into it. So there is a lot of work, earlier work, in the topological mapping camp, which just says there is a room here, and to get from this room to that room, you have to traverse this edge. At, um, <clears throat> and so that makes a lot of sense. Uh, because you, you don't maybe want to model an entire building up to the millimeter to be able to navigate into it. But what, what is not um, well or well done okay, in those topological mapping things is reasoning about uncertainty in a topological map. What, what, what if there is maybe an edge okay, between, between one room or another? <coughs> and um, so I'm going to skip this slide, but, but uh, okay, so here's a robot that ran around and saw a couple of special places in the environment where it like saw a junction or something. But the, <clears throat> the uh, odometry of the robot is very noisy. So in fact, even though they're all the same place, they, if you just use the odometry, they're in completely different places. And so this is the ground crew topology, which is kind of an H-shaped environment, all right? Um, <clears throat> but it could be a different topology really, right? We actually don't know what the true topology is. Maybe maybe it is H-shaped, but maybe these two things are really different rooms and they're not connected. Or maybe uh, the topology is like this, so there's in fact two rooms in the middle there. Um, so what is, um, what's the space of, of this topology? Well, um, it, it turns out that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between topologies of a set of special places and something called set partitions. And a set partition is something if you have five balls in this case, uh, you can put them um, in five different bags, or you can say that they're all in the same bag, right? Um, or you can put them in any, you know, this is the case where they're all in the same bag. This is the case where there is four bags and here is three bags, but all different kind of ways to put five balls into at most five different bags is a space of set partitions. Um, Well-known combinatorial object grows very, very quickly with the number of balls you have. Okay. Uh, there is something called the bell number, which uh, grows as follows. If you have one ball, there is only one set partition, I guess, or no, uh, zero balls. One ball, you have two, and then two balls, three balls, blah, 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 blah. And so it grows up to billions and billions with only 20 special places. Okay, so um, again, when faced with large combinatorial spaces, uh, we think MCMC, and um, so we sample in those spaces. Um, and I'll, the MCMC sampler here, it's just, we're not going to get into any detail, but it's, it's a certain proposal. To, to change the topology in a specific way, and then we, we calculate an acceptance ratio. Uh, we again do some rail blackization to integrate out the actual positions of these uh, special places, and the results are that we get maps. Um, so Dieter likes to show maps like this. If you use only the odometry, you get a crappy laser map like this. Um, but if you use our beautiful algorithm, you get nice and crisp maps, okay? They don't tell you that they actually don't sabotage the odometry to make it look really, really bad. Um, 
um, in the uh, in the odometry only case. But um, well, so this is not using the laser measurements at all. This is only using the odometry and a prior on how close special places are supposed to be with respect to another. So if you see a special place, um, you know, what's the chance that this is the same special place if you're so close to that special place you already saw before? And so we kind of rendered the, the laser map on top of that, and it's not nice and crisp because we don't use the laser data, but it gives you a nice uh, idea of what the building looks like. Okay, but this is using reasoning only about topologies, using as only measurement data, actually the odometry of the robot. Um, and, and it already gives pretty okay maps. So if you now do something with the lasers, basically close the loop. This, this thing closed the loop for you. Uh, okay, and, um, and that is one of the open problems in robotics, is closing the loop in a really nice way, you know, in a probabilistically nice way. And so our topology, uh, reasoning about topology is one way to do that. Um, okay, that's just a flavor, obviously. That's uh, all this stuff there. Thank you. Any questions? I just have a comment. If you're sending this the last piece of work to NIPS, be careful because they have to use probabilistic, uh, actually topological maps as a general type machine learning algorithm. I think Chris Bishop calls something like that. It's mm -hmm. not quite this, so obviously, but it's somehow related. So you might think that you're applying that as well. So you've got to be careful, I would say. Yeah, yeah, we, we, we saw that and we, we didn't know that. It, and, and thank you. Yeah. I am sending to something in the NIPS, but not this part where we sample over partitions, but actually. You can use these infinite mixtures of Gaussians um, to do very similar things. And so my student who was doing this, Anand Ranganathan, he's like into Gaussian mixtures now and Dirac lab priors and all that stuff. And which Peter also did something with, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So how, I mean, how high can you can scale it up? It seems like you would still have, you know, dimensionality problems sooner or later. Uh, no. <laughs> the the MCMC is not, the conversion of MCMC does not depend on dimensionality in this case. Or, uh, and that's that's a nice thing about it. It's it's. Um, you mean the fact that it does converge doesn't depend, or the rate of conversion? It doesn't care about the dimensionality of the space. The only thing it cares about is just about the, the size of the typical set in that space. And so, important sampling breaks down in higher dimensions because it really it, its basis. Proposal density is something that samples in this high dimensional space and then it's corrected to live only in the typical set. And if the typical set is very small with respect to the entire space, important sampling will break down. Okay. Um, MCMC does not go where there is no probability, so it lives all the way in the typical set and it tries to stay there. So, what the dimensionality of the underlying space is is not important. And, and that's why there is no. Also, if you're working online, the temporal prediction may put you in a part of the space that has no image evidence, no measurement evidence. So you may start with a place that is is not very good. Right. right. So the analogy that I, I make always is is, um, is an invasion of the Pacific. <laughs> so you have the Pacific Ocean with a couple of islands. Um, it's a very large surface of water, but then you. Important sampling is like dropping paratroopers all over in the, in the Pacific, and a lot of them die, obviously. You know, and MCMC is kind of like, you know, plane. One plane goes over, drops one super paratrooper with a compass and a lot of navigation equipment, and it swims to the islands and then walks around, swims to the next island, walks around, and kind of tries to occupy it in a temporal fashion. Um, and, and and so clearly, the larger. Um, the spaces the underlying in the Pacific, the, the, the more important sampling will do, but MCMC will still do well 
depending on what hack you put in the proposal density, because that's wherever you, you know, whatever you can say about the domain in the proposal density will allow the guy to swim to the island. Right. I mean, this, you know, the example of having simultaneous moves is very typical on two-dimensional grid MRFs, right, where any one particular flip or reversal could immediately be very slow to be single single flips, but then you do things that are larger, like the, you know, uh, and, and yeah, starting to do a paper with the, uh, with the, um, the technique called where you basically do a little change just to figure out what clique you yeah. want to flip the clock. Spend some more. Spend some more. Right. Yes. So that's sort of, you know, the in, in the space of high-dimensional Monte Carlo techniques, the, the grid MRF is one extreme example where as things are correlated, it gets more difficult to define the, a good stationary distribution or a good ground state. Right. But you're not working in those classes of problems. It's things are typically more or less the top of like the as opposed to the top of the uh, even your points along the curve, sort of, they don't necessarily track on the opposite ends. No, but we're actually also working on a paper, a se a kind of a segmentation paper that uh, does something Swenson one like, uh, inspired by, by Sanchez's paper. Yeah. Uh, right. Thank you.